Sorry, good evening. We're having fun up here. Hope you're having fun out there. Welcome to the West Hartford Schools Pub, uh, Public Schools Board of Education meeting. I know you're all here for an action-packed evening. Uh, and so let's start without any further ado. May we please have the roll call? Mrs. Blanks? Here. Dr. Greenberg? Here. Mr. Levine? Here. Mr. Paul Uke? Here. Ms. Polin? Here. Dr. Thomas Farkason? Here. Mr. Zdanowitz? Here. Student Representatives Grace Andrews? Here. Maddie Pliskin? Here. Thank you. And the pledge. Please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, thank you, and totally out of order, I just have to say that I was honored uh, about a week ago to be asked to speak at a naturalization ceremony, you know, where people become citizens, and they all stood up and they, you know, swore the oath, and then we all said the pledge, and I cried. I couldn't believe it. It was, anyway, just thinking about that as we were saying the pledge. Okay, no revision to the agenda order, correct? All right, and no student participation unless they're so small that... Nope. Okay. Public communications. Is there anyone who didn't sign up but is bursting with something to share? Okay. We're all excited to get to the real event. There's no unfinished business, so we move directly to the new business and the presentation of the superintendent's 2018-2019 budget recommendation. Oh, can I have a motion, please? Uh, <laughs> That we just that we get the board of education that we get the superintendent's uh, budget. So moved. Second. 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 Okay. Discussion. Okay. Um, so first, um, welcome to the budget season. For those of you that this is your first time um, going through the budget season, I'll just um, tell all of you you have your board books, and inside of that board book, one of the most important things you will see is the big orange tab that says read this first <laughs> because that includes all of your instructions goes through the contents of the big binder and what you'll see all the appendices all the work that goes into this budget from the from chip especially in the people in chips office um, to really put together something that is open accessible for people to understand and follow um, immediately following the presentation of the superintendent's budget or really right now the entire budget is up online for people this is we believe completely in transparency i think that it's one of those things that um you know people want to look <clears throat> what's hidden where's the hidden money there there's no hidden money it's pretty much all all here and all open to people so um happy for your feedback as you know the way tonight goes is basically my presentation to you and then as we go through the budget workshops, you have time over the next couple of weeks to digest more of this, spend time, identify your questions. If there are questions ahead of time about a specific, then shoot an email ahead of time so we'll know what we're going to be discussing that night or what kind of things you're thinking about. General philosophical, of course, but if something comes up to you at the meeting, by all means, feel free. Fire away to us. We just want to be prepared as much as we can be as we answer the specific components. So what I'm going to do tonight 
is giving you an overview of the budget for 2018-2019. This is the hallmark of uh, the democratic process, really, in town government, is the approval of the school budget and followed by the town budget. You have a unique role in that we often, um, we talk a lot about what we believe in, and then we show what we believe in by how we spend our money. And, and that's really an important thing that I believe about government and about everybody. And so last year we spent a very difficult season um, because of what the state was looking at as far as budget cuts for us. And we had to put things out there. And the best part of last year's budget season, through a time that was exhausting and very difficult, and um, that kept us all wondering what are the right things to do, was the way the community came out and really made demands about education in this town and told us what they would stand for, what they wouldn't stand for. And it helped to, for myself anyway, reinvigorate my own belief that we're trying to deliver what the parents of this community, and not just the parents, the entire community that supports West Hartford schools so distinctly really demands from us. And that's excellence. And that, that can be difficult at times, it can be frustrating at times, but that is what's demanded of us. So tonight I present my budget summary. This is the proposal. The moment I present it to you, it becomes your budget. And you will, over the course of the next few weeks, um, debate the budget, vote on the budget, and look at it moving forward. Some budgets we're tearing apart. Other budgets come in and it just moves a little more smoothly. We'll see how this one goes. One of the things that's been unique is my time as superintendent. Three of the four years um, that I've presented have either been snowing, bitterly cold, or about to be snowing. Yet the night you vote on the budget has been exceptionally warm and we're opening windows because it's so hot in this room. So really, for those that are frustrated, this is the beginning of the end, even with um, pending snow tomorrow. Um, not that it helps me with my graduation date at all, but uh, we'll get to that later. Um, so let's talk about the budget. Before I do, I need to thank so many administrators in the room that contribute to this all of our department supervisor system principals, principals um, who make demands, try to see what their building needs. And I can tell you right now, the answer is we always need more. Whenever somebody asks, shouldn't there be more? Well, the answer is always more. We have a unique responsibility to meet the demands of community combined with the community's ability to pay. And it is something I take seriously that we can't just ask for everything. We have to have a balance. And that means we balance security with curriculum. It doesn't mean we prioritize anything less than another, but there always is a balance of all the things that we're spending from general education to special education, from athletics to music. Um, this is really trying to encompass an educational system that believes in uplifting the mind and body of our students and keeping them having opportunities to become their best selves and to find something in that school day that they find inspiring so that they will keep achieving. So I want to thank all my administrators in helping with that. I want to thank the executive team, Rick, Gretchen, Rosina. We meet about, we talk about this every week in general terms. Andy Morrow, um, Paul also, I should have thrown Paul in, he talks about it sometimes. Um, <laughs> But Andy Morrow, Chip, and myself, we meet every week starting in September to start putting this together and looking at all the trends and everything else. And um, obviously you know that if there is somebody that just their work is remarkable, it's Chip Ward, when it comes to this. So um, I thank him for his counsel and his work on this. So the budget. I already jumped ahead. We're going to go back to the beginning. Ah, all right. So West Hartford Public Schools, our students, because we need to talk about who, who is this for. We have 9,678 students pre-K through 12. What does that mean? Uh, as people talk often, and I was at a meeting 
at the New England representatives of the College Board talking about the drain of population from New England, what that means for colleges in coming years, and the pressure on colleges. Uh, we've heard a lot of discussion about this in Connecticut, and we've seen other districts closing schools. We've had decline in Rome. We had about 30 less students this year, but that's kind of been somewhat typical, and we've seen a decrease in the number of elementary teachers over that time. So we've had less elementary sections. But we're talking about 30 kids a year spread out over 16 schools and then spread out over 13 plus grades with pre-K. So realistically, I mean, you're talking about uh, two tenths of a kid per grade per school. So it's, you don't get that big bang. If all 30 were in one grade at one school, yes, that would be one less teacher. And over time, certainly, if it's a 10-year period, then you're talking about, okay, you're slowly building that. But that's what we saw this year. We're anticipating basically the same next year. But who makes up those students? Because that, that's different because that's 9,678 individuals. That's 9,678 uh, babies that were held at one point that have grown up that we want to see their potential reached. 2,159 of them, 22%, have a non-English home language. 74 different home languages spoken in the home. We talked about this a few board meetings ago. This, I can't find another district with more home languages, and I've checked. Um, I keep trying to see if there's another one out there. It's not. But that is, it's just one of the so special things. And you talk as you send your kids out in the world. West Hartford kids have a unique cosmopolitan experience of having met people from other places that that just isn't afforded in every community in this state or this country, and it makes our education far richer. 4,146% of our students are minority. Um, that terminology is gonna be changing soon, that goes up 1% a year, almost uh, every year, basically. So we're talking, realistically, we're five to seven years to being minority majority in West Hartford, which, which shows the mix and the blend of students in this school, kind of the tapestry that makes it so exciting, just as the home languages do, to really get to know a, such a wide variety of peers. And it's why sometimes some things that adults think, oh, that's interesting, to the kids it's not interesting at all because it's just their life, which is fantastic. Um, we have 2,067 students on free and reduced lunch. That's 21% of our student body. And I, I do want to stop on this for a second because it gets glossed over because you use terms all the time, free and reduced lunch, free and reduced lunch. And we talk about it with our, when we do our cafeteria reports and it's just thrown out there and people always want to know this is one of those things, this information is kept absolutely confidentially. We don't use it for sorting purposes or things like that. But I want to tell you what it means and then I want you to think about what that would mean in West Hartford. To be um, on reduced lunch, in West Hartford, for a family of four, would mean a total family income of $45,500. $45,500 on reduced lunch. Um, think of rents in West Hartford and what that means. To be on free lunch for a family of four, that's $31,980. $31,980. Look at apartment costs throughout town. Look at apartment costs in areas where people think, well, that's a cheaper area you want to live. Well, when you look at it, they're spending half of their income on that housing. And they're choosing to live in West Hartford as opposed to living somewhere else so that their children get the best education. So those parents are investing enormously in their children and their children's potential. If we're talking about a family of two, by the way, we're talking about a single parent and their child. That's, um, that's an income of um, 21,000, basically $21,100 per year for free lunch. It's $30,000 for a reduced lunch. And again, we know what it costs to live here. 1,186, 12% of our student body so just to go back one second, think about it another way. One in five of our kids are in free and reduced lunch. That's one in five of our kids. 1,186 kids, 
12% of our pre-K 12 students receive special education services. And we put that number out there, 12%, what does it mean? This is more than any other number the most difficult to describe because even using the category special education is difficult because it encompasses every area of need for these children. And one of the things that Gretchen has done a tremendous job of is not categorizing kids by their disability and, and making sure that we're not thinking of somebody based on that simple of a term when we know what, how intricate each diagnosis might be. So, historical perspective of where we rank, and this is a familiar slide to many of you, but it's an important one. Because 40 years ago, West Hartford spent more than any other community in Connecticut, and at one point, um, in the top 10 nationally, and maybe even number one nationally, on uh, per pupil expenditure. This is out of the 169 communities in the state. Uh, we are now 117th. See an uptick this past year. Our budget was a little bit larger, as we know. We had those health care increases last year. But we are 117th out of 169 towns in the state of Connecticut. I can promise you our expectations from our community are not 117th out of 169. This explains that last slide. So when we're asked about value, and if we want to be smart consumers, we should always talk about value. And are we getting bang for our buck? And this is so important because this really contextualizes it. And it also answers a lot of things. When you say 117th, people say, oh, but this, but that. This answers a lot of those but this. Because we're $15,761 per pupil. Dirk B, we all know, is the comparison that's made for us that we don't shy away from. Paul Vicenis always says, we don't shy away from our kids' achievement levels being compared to Sinbury, South Windsor, Glasbury, Farmington, Avon, but also Fairfield, Madison. That's what we're talking about with Dirk Bay. Their average net current expenditure per pupil is $16,933, almost $17,000 per pupil. So if we were to spend at the exact same level per pupil as Dirk B, so we look at their scores, well, what are they doing? One of the things they're doing is they're spending almost $12 million more in their budget per year. So if we had spent at that cost, our budget would be $12 million more. Okay, but Dirk B's an expensive area. We understand that. So let's talk about the state average. Well, the state average, we'd be spending $8.2 million more to reach the state average expenditure per child. The biggest thing you'll have people say that will say to me is, but you have benefits of scale. We're the ninth largest school district in the state of Connecticut. So we don't have that kind of small town where you have one cost that overruns things. Okay, let's compare us then to the top 10 largest school districts in the state of Connecticut. If we spent at what they spent, average net current expenditure per pupil, our budget would be $6 million higher. So this slide to me explains our efficiency. And by the way, I can't take credit for the efficiency. This has been going on for a long time. Every year we're looking to get better, but this is, this is what we do. So where is that growth? And this is something we always talk about that I always want to be careful about because I never want um, any special education parent to think that we're saying we shouldn't be spending any money on their child. This is in no way, this is no way to be used as measurement of blame. This is purely to be used explanatorily for those who say, well, your enrollment's decreased, why have your numbers of employees gone up? This is really the, this is really why. From 2010 to 11 to 16, 17 school year, general inflation we've seen gone up 10.2%. It's been a low inflationary period, which is great. Our regular education expenses have gone up 13.2% during that time. Now, I wish our regular education expenses exactly matched inflation. It was 10.2%. The reason it doesn't is because of health care costs. We know that. Okay? Health care costs, wages, that's our driver that we don't really have a choice in. But then you come to where is the growth? 
Our special education expenditures are up 38% during that same time period. Our pupils count. As people say, you're declining enrollment. Well, we've, we have 105 more students identified as special education during that time. So that's up almost 10%. Our staff count in this area is up almost 12% because the needs of the students that are identified are changing. And the needs of our staffing to meet what, what a lot of these kids require to get the education that they deserve are changing. So our per pupil costs in special education are up 27%. So that's the unique driver educationally. And I honestly, I say this, every parent should be asking for exactly what their child needs and demanding that of us. And so this is the reality of the situation. It isn't unique to West Hartford that special education costs are driving, um, uh, kind of driving the educational train. In West Hartford, however, we are a destination district for a few specific disabilities. When people say, where do we go? What's the best? The answer is often West Hartford. People from out of state know it. The, the amount of people that I get communication from that are toying for moving here out of state that get me on the phone, get a letter, special education is typically one of the major drivers for these parents. So what's the budget look like and what's coming forward? All right, so we use the term roll forward budget to mean next year we're going to do the exact same thing we do this year, which logically should mean we'll spend the exact same thing that we spent this year, except that's not true. And the major reason is because of salaries, because salaries are negotiated over time, vote negotiated with the board, with the Board of Education voting, and with a new contract up this fall. So you'll have those late nights coming again soon. Um, that budget increase for salaries is $2.22 million. And that's a 2.15% increase on the budget. And this is really um, explained by the fact the average wage increase is 3.3% due to step costs. But I do want it known that we're people of our word. When we passed last year's budget, we said we'd freeze till we have better understanding from the state and see what things we could get through the year without. And because of that freeze, we're under budget in our salaries account by 1% this year. Um, so that offsets next year's salaries when you look at it that way. Um, so that 2.15% of the budget. Medical expenses this year, this is the biggest numerical good news story. And this is, in many ways, become really the story of the budget I present. Whether I'm presenting you a budget that makes you grab your torches for me or a budget that makes you say, okay. And this year it's okay because our medical expenses, our claims are projected to be under budget this year according to our outside consultant, which is what we make that judgment by in January. And I often tell all of you when you're asking December, November, it's like, well, our health care, but sometimes we see spikes in November. Now that we've moved to an HSA plan, there's spikes at different times in the year. Um, but we feel very comfortable that this year our claims are under budget. We're budgeting for next year for a typical growth in claims. And again, when we do the larger budget presentation, Chip will explain it more how these are smoothed out over time anyway, but one bad year certainly affects your whole budget. Other parts of the roll forward, pension, expense, pension expenses decreasing by $310,000. Okay, so the town basically gives us a bill for pensions and we have to pay it. And typically over the past four years, for not four years, past forever years, we've paid 25% of the town pension costs. These are our non-teacher administrative positions because um, the people in this room, teachers, administrators, they're part of the state teacher's retirement plan. This is all the other employees that work for West Harvard Public Schools combined with West Hartford's employees. We had in the past spent, contributed 25% of the total fund. 
Overall, our share of the pension contribution is dropping to 21.33% of the total fund. We had an ac outside actuarial that looked at it and came up with this number. So we can think to ourselves, that's great. Look, we just saved $310,000. We all know we didn't really because the town's paying for it now and it's all out of the same budget. But this is the educational budget. This reflects what our education spending is in that budget. Our transportation expenses have increased by $480,000. This is all because of the bus contract. Um, our bus contract was up. We went out to bid. We got three bids. We chose the lowest bid. But there's only so much you can do. Typically, people will say if bus costs are high, well, why don't we go out to bid? Well, this fuel prices increase and overall bid increase. Realistically, you could buy your own bus fleet. But then you're hiring your own bus drivers. You're going through this whole process. And it's a massive outlay at one point, And you're taking on all the risk, all the insurance, all those issues. It's why districts don't do it anymore. The problem is because of the massive outlay, there's not huge competition in the field of transportation. I've often said to people, and they say, what business should I invest in? I say, school transportation. <laughs> um, start bidding against these companies. Um, but so basically, that's a $480,000 increase there, a little over 6%. So that's a big jump. Another big jump is tuition expenses have increased by $630,000. Um, this... Uh, Per student tuition expenses keep increasing. The state isn't reimbursing, is, is actually reimbursing at the exact same rate, even though the costs are going up, and we have more out-of-district placements. So it's something that is a driver. All other expenses combined in the budget are 4.4%, 4 .4 $670,000. dollars this is mostly inflation. We had a tremendous copier contract. When you think, well, how could that really affect something this size? Think of 16 schools plus, plus central office. Think of the pure number of copiers. And if your average copier cost, copy cost doubles or something like that, it's significant. And then in addition, the new lease at ASD for the 11 Wampanoag site that we had outgrown its usage and move to that site, and a few of you visited, I know, thank you very much for going over. Um, that's a $670,000 increase. So we're at 3.69 million, 2.31% for the roll forward, doing just what we did this year. Instead of zero, it's 2.31%. Changes, enrollment needs. So one of the unique things about budgeting is we've had this ability to decrease our FTs the past few years in the elementary school as those larger classes have moved on. That ended this year. We're flat now. We don't have a huge fifth grade going out replaced by a small kindergarten. We have a fifth grade going out that's the exact same size as the kindergarten. Meanwhile, we have a very large senior class at Connor and Hall, I'm sorry, a small senior class at Connor and Hall going out being replaced by a large incoming ninth grade class. So with those 80 or so extra students, and again, this is right now, remember ninth grade is also the time where we tend to get an increase in people coming back from eighth grade private schools. We don't ever really know. This year we had more kids in, specifically at Hall, than we had expected. So we, we kind of operated under budget at the high school this year as far as FTEs go. Now those 80 kids of each take five classes when the fact is they'll probably sign up for six classes or five and a half classes, that's 400 more section requests for courses. That equals about five and a half teachers. Um, it keeps class sizes manageable. Those will split between Connor and Hall, give you exact breakdown as we go through what the split looks like depending on the population of both schools. We have a uh, meeting in mid-March where we get all the course requests in at both schools. We sit down with Dan, Julio, myself, Paul, basically all the executive team and kind of hammer out where each section goes across. And that's that. those are really difficult because you're deciding at that point to cancel some classes. This um, allows our high schools basically to stay the same. School refusal and family engagement. This is a 
new, this is an increase. So these are the changes that aren't the roll forward. So Gretchen's going to go into this a lot during the workshop, and I know you'll have questions for it, and it's kind of a fascinating topic in that this is about those students that are not able to access the school environment because of most chiefly anxiety issues, mental health issues that are keeping them from school and keeping them from engaging. And the cost associated with that that's not reflected here, what we're spending now is those students are often placed during a program at IOL, um, sometimes Wheeler Clinic. It depends on the type of situation. But we're outsourcing people to work with those students that aren't in. But you have to identify them first. So during that whole process, our assistant principals, our school counselors, and really, I used to think of school refusal in terms of a high school issue. This has gone down throughout our schools now. So we're talking about our school psychologists, our school principals, that are working in an area, and one of the key elements of this is family engagement. Now we see when we talk about mental health how important family engagement is. To work with parents and the family at home, guardians, to talk about and train and work together and give that counseling necessary to get those children back in school. This isn't the 50s and 60s where we can just say, well, they're dropouts. You know, that's not appropriate. We've got to do everything we can to bring them back. Right now we're spending a lot of money to bring in experts that are consulting with each child. By creating a team, um, which would be basically two special education teachers, two TAs, the special education teacher, really one focused on in school, bringing the students back, one focused on being out in the community with those families that are working on this. Uh, we believe that in the long run, there's a savings financially perhaps in what we're spending on the outsource piece now. But there's also a mental health savings within the building is we have people that this isn't what they do really. This isn't their expertise, spending their time, spending their resources working on this area, that having a, a unique position focused on this area will allow them even more time with their students in the building. So that's the focus. This is a Gretchen idea, Gretchen program. She's talked to other people about how they're working on and with her whole team, I should say. And it used to be we were talking, I can tell you, very recently we were talking about 10, 15 kids in the district. We're in the 60s now, okay, over a two-year period, this growth. This is the biggest area of worrisome growth that I see in the district right now. Um, and I'd love to tell you, and here's the reason why, so this is what we need to do. Uh, I can't tell you that because each individual case is a little bit different. Again, Gretchen will be able to answer much more of your questions about this. Post-secondary program enhancements. This is something, uh, this in some ways might be the thing I feel most passionately about in the budget. Um, and I've mentioned this before to you. I believe that what our society is doing with our, um, our most needy children, once they become 21, 22, is an abomination to decent society. I think our cuts, the Department of Social Services, Department of Developmental Services, I'll be honest, last year as I kept going to the state and testifying, I'd run into the leaders of these groups and I'd be like, I feel guilty, I should testify for them instead of West Hartford because I so believe in what they're arguing for too. Because we do a really good job with kids until they're 21 years old, providing structure, providing training, and then it stops. And it's stopping just as oftentimes parents are reaching a point where they're aging and they're beginning to worry about who's gonna take care of my child. And so one of the big reasons for the move to ASD was all the things that, that in that building, at uh, the Cogswell building, it offers in that we can have a room dedicated to becoming apartment-style room for apartment living. So that's part of this program so that kids can you know, train there. What would, what would it be like to live independently? 
But in addition to that, there's a commercial grade kitchen there. And we've already made conversations and deep in discussion with our farm. And how can we partner with the development of a greenhouse where our kids can work and look at farm to table programs. And I'd like to, our commercial kitchen to be used for those kids can work and I always believe you should use the natural resources available at your disposal. It might not be a natural resource, but if West Hartford had one, it's restaurants. And so <laughs> if we were going to look at how do we do what we can do for these kids, it's partnering with our restaurants. And I would love to tell you that I'm going to be the one that's going to be out there knocking on restaurant doors, and I will, as will Gretchen, as will anybody that's in this room and anybody that's out there that's watching, let us know. But we need somebody that's an entrepreneur. We need somebody that's a contracted service to start this program. That doesn't mean this is a forever position. We need someone to start the program, to liaison with restaurants, to liaison with our special education staff, to make these connections so that not only are we training these kids so that they're working in this program while they're with us, but then we're placing them in positions once they're 21, 22. And so that we're better serving and we're better planning for their families. West Hartford can do this. I'd like to do it so that we become the model for other communities and prove to them this is how you can do it. And maybe eventually we're bringing kids in from other communities and this becomes something that we're actually using our facilities to help and getting payment from other places. I don't know yet, it all depends on space, but this is, of the things, I'm, a, I'm proud of this budget, that's the thing, I'm glad we're doing things like that. So, um, so don't cut that. Um, <laughs> all other things, this really comes down to um, our pay for substitutes and TAs, I've told you, you know um, we have to meet market conditions. This increases TA and sub pay to $90 per day and increases special education TA pay to $95 a day because we need to assure that those positions are filled. Um, I wish we didn't have to include this because it's one of those areas when you spend $100,000 and I just described a program and I believe people are gonna see that and I can make videos and show people, this is $265,000 nobody's gonna see but we, we just can't do without it. In addition, this is also a point for interpreter and assistive tech stipends at the high school to help us. As you know, we've had a um, large increase in deaf and hearing impaired students over the past two years, a dramatic increase in that area. So this will help us to meet those needs for those kids. So increases besides the roll forward is a total of $1 million or 0.63%. So the total budget summary, we were at $159.86 million, kept it under 160 million last year, look at that. Um, roll forward would be 3.68 million, add in that other $1 million I just described, it's a $4.68 million budget increase or 2.94%. So the 2018-19 budget under this document would be 164.55 million dollars. I don't take that lightly what I'm asking from the community. I don't take it lightly what I'm asking for you. I believe we can be trusted with your money. I believe we provide on the investment and we give a great return. That being said, that's what you guys are elected for. This is, this is your number one job, is deciding on what is the appropriate expenditure level to meet the educational needs of this community. And um, and you should immerse yourself in it and don't, don't ever feel bad about asking questions of us about this. If we can't answer a question with a why, shame on us. So, next steps. Budget workshop number one, March 14th, Town Hall, 7 p.m. That's where we'll go through, there's a, there's a separate page behind the orange page that goes through what the increases were to this year's budget. So it kind of looks at, this is what was adopted, this is what we actually needed. In most areas we spent less in a couple areas, we said, no, we needed something, so we actually spent more this year. We look at that, and then the third column will be, this is what we're looking at for next year, and this is why. Andy Morrow, Paul Vicenis will be there to present. I've told Paul he can't spend an hour on each topic, but, you know, we'll get to that. Um, that's March 14th. Board public hearing, March 28th at Town Hall at 7 p.m. 
Now, this is the one we don't know. That can be a night that goes for a long time, or it can be a night two years ago, I think we had one speaker. Um, immediately after that public hearing portion at 7, we go into budget workshop number 2. That budget workshop is more focused on pupil services expenditures, where Gretchen's here explaining more of her spending. Then we go to the board budget adoption, April 3rd, town hall, 7 p.m. So about a month from now, as I said, I promise it'll be warm and sunny. And then the town council adoption, April 24th, town hall at 7 p.m. Last year, this was a time of great consternation. I'm hoping it's not that way. Last year, this town spoke out. We can't ask them every year. We can't threaten people every year because eventually, Either they don't believe crises are really crisis, if you're in a moment of crisis. And the other thing is sometimes they're going to lose confidence that you're going to keep providing things. So if we put up pre-K every year, which I don't want to put up pre-K any year, but if you tell me we had to cut $12 million, pre-K is going to be on the list because it's a big ticket item. But eventually parents are going to say, pre-K, full day kindergarten, you're really talking about that? And eventually if they believe it, West Hartford won't be their same destination. Our home values are good. I think our budget's always reflected in our real estate numbers. Now I know people can read our real estate numbers differently, but in terms of in the area, people are still choosing West Hartford and they're choosing it for the schools. So that's what the schedule looks like. That's what the budget looks like. And I'm happy over the next few weeks to answer any questions. By the way, this is also the superintendent's report, so you don't have to ask me for that either. But Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I just want to say, I, I know I speak for the entire board, but half-day kindergarten is off the table. It will never, ever yes. happen yes. that we will go back to half-day kindergarten. End. Okay. Just saying that. Um, I actually do have a quick question, if that's okay, yes. um, which is, this is the budget part. Can you say something about the income part, like um, open, uh, uh, choice program, stuff like that? We'll talk about that during the workshop portion. Oh, okay. I mean, it, those basically, we won't see an increase because we're at the number that we were at last year in terms of 2%. So we'll keep getting the same percentage back from the state that we'll get then. But Chip will go through that during the workshop with any questions. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Okay, uh, then all in favor of... Um, accepting, receiving the superintendent's recommended 2018-2019 education budget. Please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. I was really hoping you'd accidentally approve it there and we could just I be know. done. <laughs> <laughs> nope. That's, that's why receiving was the word, the key word. Yep, exactly. Uh, so we can skip the superintendent's report. Uh, staff reports? Uh, okay, we move right to approval of the minutes. Uh, any, first of all, um, can I hear a motion that we approve the minutes of the regular Board of Education meeting? Can I make a motion that we approve the minutes from February 21st? Second. Second. Any changes or corrections? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, moving right along. Board members. Uh, any communications or reports or uh, any other information you guys have to share? Okay. Uh, then the only thing that everybody is still waiting for, the report from the student board, uh, student board representatives. Hello. Um, Hall principal Mr. Zatoon just announced a six-week leave of absence and the Hall community would like to welcome Miss Ann McKernan who will be offering support to the Hall office team throughout this next month and a half and I personally have seen Miss McKernan um, in school like she stopped into my math class to meet the teacher so it's nice to see um, her like jumping in and getting involved already. Uh, about two weeks ago, the hockey captain Drew Booth was severely injured playing against Connard. He suffered broken eye sockets in both eyes a broken nose and other injuries. He underwent 11 hours of neurological and reconstructive surgery and is now recovering. There is a void within the Hall community and we are all praying for him and hoping he'll be back soon. 
Girls basketball just won state quarterfinals and advances to the semifinals versus Enfield on Friday. This is to be held in Bloomfield and I think at 7 p.m. The in-school SAT is March 21st and that will be a full Wednesday, so um, 1248 dismissal will not be happening that day. Pops and Jazz 60th anniversary is opening this weekend and playing for the next two weekends. Come see this favorite event and so many of Hall's musically and artistically talented students. It's every year it's amazing and this is the 60th anniversary and the choir teachers like of many years it's her last year doing it so it will be a show to see. And another favorite annual event that's going on is the dodgeball tournament and today is the second day out of three days and then there will be like playoffs and finals. It's, it's a big deal. Um, and there's lots of fun and there's a huge crowd. Um, and students have requested that Board of Ed members be notified and invited about invited to um, the, a walkout on March 14th, um, the National School Walkout protesting gun violence. Um, they want you guys to be there to see their activism, leadership, and unity for the greater good and safety of all, because I know that for the students who are organizing it and care deeply about it. This is something that they want you to understand and um, as Board of End members I think this might give you a greater insight of what the students who you do all this hard work for care about. So thank you. Before you continue I just want to say first of all obviously we all wish Dan Zatoon's family um, uh, well as well uh, and about the March 14th thing. If you could send me an email with details then we can the, uh, the only thing, the only but, cautionary I want to say about this mm -hmm. is we will be closing off the campus to adults. We need to make sure it's safe anytime we have people going outside. Um, so I can certainly make arrangements to you. You're part of the school community, but I don't want people to think that there's a large invite because we cannot have people we don't know on campus. Well, we can stand outside and watch. But anyway, if, if you can send us the information, yes. we can decide what we're going to do. But okay. thank you. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. Maddie, did you want uh, the uh, track, boys, New England's going to nationals? Oh, um, this past, thank you, this past weekend, the um, boys track team went to the New England um, championships and the 4x800 relay race won, and that was um, three juniors and one senior. So congratulations to them. That's really exciting. They're going to nationals. Where is that? It's, I learned that it's East Coast because indoor is a East Coast thing in California and the West Coast don't do uh, indoor track. But they're, they're going. <laughs> they yeah. have outdoors so they, there. They, 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 they don't need the indoor track. Uh, so I, it's the, they go to New England's uh, and, and they're favored to be one of the top three in New England. I mean, in the, in the nation. Wow. So it's a big, big deal. Cool. Thank you. Yay us. <laughs> All of West Hartford should celebrate, but... Okay, so Conard's annual musical production is making its opening debut this Friday, March 9th, with shows running through the 17th, and tickets are still available, and everybody is welcome to purchase them. The link to purchase the tickets is on the Conard website homepage, so we invite everyone to come and check it out. It's really different than the plays we've have, have in the past, so um, it's exciting to see, and I hope the audience will like it. Additionally, the National Art Honor Society at Conard is hosting a fundraiser for Puerto Rico during lunch waves so it's an opportunity for students to purchase beautiful bowls and jewelry for a worthy cause um, and the fundraiser table is located in the calf during um, lunch waves also the junior and senior class board are finalizing decisions about prom music and tickets and the Conard Student Council is hosting our annual vo volleyball tournament on Thursday, March 15th at 6 p.m. in the Conard Gym. And all Conard students are encouraged to gather a team of six and play and pick up a sheet from Ms. Casey in the library to sign up. Spectators are also all welcome. Uh, spring sports tryouts are right around the corner, and we're excited for another awesome season. And finally, as many of you probably know, Conard beat the Hall Southington hockey game today in a states game at Veterans Rink. I'm really proud of the team, and I'm proud of the school spirit that Conard sh um, showed today at the game. Uh, so the Conard Ho High School hockey team will be playing North Branford this Friday at Trinity's Rink as they advance to the next round of states. Thank you. Outstanding. Okay, those of you who couldn't get enough, there's future business to come to. Uh, Wednesday, March 14th, as you heard, is the 
uh, Board of Ed Budget Workshop Number One at seven o'clock. Tuesday, March twentieth, a quick six days later, is a regular Board of Ed meeting, also at seven o'clock. March twenty eighth, as you heard, is the public hearing at seven, followed by a budget workshop again. That's Budget Workshop Number Two, and then Tuesday, April third, is a regular Board of Ed meeting, uh, and the adoption of the budget uh, again at seven o'clock. Um, any request for future agenda items? Uh, okay, I just have to say that um, the Trinity College faculty in, an, ex in um, an exploration of how to use clickers, because we're a little behind the times, um, had to vote to, on whether or not we would recommend that Trinity have a snow day tomorrow, uh, which is non-binding because Trinity doesn't have snow days. But nevertheless, I just want to say that 96% of us voted for a snow day. Just saying. I'd like to talk to those four percent of smart, well-rounded people who are New England, who are New England tough. Clearly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, we'll Where, be there anyway because that's our job. But. I will just tell you this: it is. I've I've been in communication with area superintendents pretty much around the area. People are waiting till the morning till the next weather report comes in. Cause there is one dry spot that we're waiting to see what the reports come in. I would say if we have school, I would anticipate it would be an earlier Early emergency dismissal. dismissal. Um, but that would be 11, 12, and 1, so we really have to see what's 1 o'clock going to look like. So more information as the night goes on. Exactly. Uh, uh, so stay warm and safe. Uh, and can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. Okay. I'm going to vote. We're all going to vote by my banging the gavel. Uh, all right. Oh. Oh. I just think so because nobody signed up. Do, do you right, think no I'm? Oh my gosh, you're right though. Oops. Nobody signed up. Nobody signed up. I, Should we just ask? I, they were all my uh, employees. If they want to say something, it was all. We forgot.